We want to take some time tonight and um, consider uh, practical helps for prayer. We've been uh, going through John 16 on Sunday mornings. We've spent three weeks in that text. And um, the main point of that text, as we've been talking about, is drawing near to God in prayer and the Lord's instruction to the disciples to do just that. In their time of need, they can go to God in prayer and God will supply uh, their need. He provides for us through the means of prayer. And so as we've worked through John 16 these last three weeks, we've learned the importance of prayer, I hope. Pray that's been laid upon your heart the way it has been on mine. That prayer is important. It is a weighty need for the Christian. And as we've worked through the text, we really have um, established somewhat of a systematic theology uh, for prayer. And uh, through that, looking at the necessity of prayer, the importance of prayer, the weight of prayer, the place of prayer in the exercise of our faith in Christ, in the face of a hostile world, in the face of the ministry, the great commission that we've all been given, and the purpose of prayer, the, the implications of prayer, of the grace afforded to us through prayer. As so we've learned a lot from that text with respect to prayer. And we pray primarily, initially, because we understand our need for God. If you're in Christ, Uh, You understand your need for God. We talked about that this morning. We pray because God the Father loves us, uh, because Jesus Christ at the cross has secured for us access to God in prayer. He mediates for us in prayer. He is our advocate there for us at the right hand of God the Father. Uh, Even the Spirit comes along, right? When we don't know how to pray as we ought, the Spirit intercedes on our behalf with groanings which cannot be uttered. All this blessing and glory and help associated with the blessed privilege of prayer. So now, thinking through that for this evening, I thought we'd spend a little bit of time and build on that foundation that the Lord has established for us in John chapter 16. And I want to give you, in the next uh, few minutes together, I want to give you uh, some practical help with that. Uh, Maybe uh, you have, as I have in the past, struggled with a plan for prayer, how to pray. The disciples asked the Lord, obviously, Luke 11, teach us to pray. They needed help with that. We all need help at some point or another with that. And so I want to give you some practical help. How do we know how to do that which we know we must do with respect to prayer? And uh, I want to give you first three subdivisions, if you will, for how to think about this, right? In one respect, we're to think about prayer as a duty, In another respect, we're to think about prayer as a dialogue. And lastly, we're to think about prayer as our delight. And I want to give you some practical applications for those. But we want to cultivate through prayer as a duty, as a dialogue, and as our delight. And first and foremost, it begins with the fact that prayer is given to us in Scripture as a duty. Now, you can think about something in the Christian life that is a duty as being oppressive on you or restrictive to you or difficult for you. Listen, that is not the right way to think about duties in the Christian life. As the Lord would have it, in his infinite wisdom and in his infinite grace and mercy toward us in Christ, the duties that he gives us are for our good. And we find that when we do our duty, we're blessed through that, and it quickly becomes our delight, right? But prayer is a duty. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, he says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. This morning in John 16, the Lord was uh, telling them that in him they will have peace. That peace, in large part, comes through prayer, dependence upon God. Right. So prayer is a duty. Now, I want to press on you (laughs) the fact that it is a duty. We are mandated by Scripture, by the Word of God, to pray, and that we are, in obeying the Lord, we are to cultivate prayer as a habit through regular discipline. Now, you start putting words together like habit, and discipline and duty in the same sentence, and there, some evangelicals start <laughs> getting a nervous twitch because it sounds to them like legalism. Listen, it is not legalistic to pray. It's not legalistic for the Lord to require prayer, and he does so in his word, and it's not legalistic for you and I as Christians to devote time to the Lord in prayer. It is not legalism, 
right? You need to understand the definition of legalism if you are confused by that. You need to have a habit of regular disciplined prayer. Now, we have examples of that, obviously, in the Scripture. Daniel prayed three times a day, right? Others throughout history, Calvin, Luther, others, say that you at least need to pray twice daily. So is Luther or Calvin legalistic because they tell you it would be good for you to pray, pray twice daily? No, no. Twice daily. Prayer is a duty. We have to, in cultivating prayer as a duty, guard ourselves against deluding or destructive notions, right? That there are other things more important. Conceiving of prayer as our duty to God, being that it is also required by God in the Scripture, helps protect us from putting other priorities in its place. If you think that, um, you know, in the morning, right, the alarm goes off, and you think to yourself, you've got this to do, and that to do, and the other thing to do, and the whole day already, from the time the alarm goes off, the whole day is just stacking up on you, uh, don't forget the importance and the priority of prayer. We need to cultivate the duty of putting prayer first. Don't, Calvin says, don't listen to those notions that say, let me do this or that first. Pray, pray. We have a need to pray. We've got a responsibility to pray. It is our duty to pray. It is paramount, of paramount importance when it comes to our Christian growth and maturity, right? We need to pray. So conceive of prayer, think of prayer as a duty because it is, because it is, okay? But it's a duty. Think of prayer as a duty like this, right? It's a prayer is a duty for the Christian like wearing a hazmat suit is a duty for someone handling infectious diseases at the CDC, all right? If you don't wear your hazmat suit, you're going to die, right? Prayer is a necessity, like I think we've talked about in the sermon, like walking out of the space shuttle airlock without your space helmet. So it is as much a duty to put on your space helmet in order to leave the space shuttle as it is for a Christian to pray, right? Without it, you die. You wither, you're dried up, eventually cast out as a branch, right? We must pray. Sometimes prayer is difficult, and it feels like a duty. But as Luther would say, or Calvin, or others have said, pray even when you don't feel like it. Even when you don't feel like it, you pray. You cultivate a habit, a discipline of prayer in your Christian life. Look with me quickly at Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Just speaking, Paul speaking, uh, or alluding to sometimes the difficulty of prayer. Romans chapter 15. Down in verse 30. Listen to Paul, to the, to the Romans, the Christians in Rome. Verse 30. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. You know, sometimes prayer feels like a striving, right? Feels like a, uh, an agonizing, feels like a difficulty, feels like work. It takes determined resolve. Here, Paul pleading with them, begging them to strive together with him in prayer. We need to pray, and it's that important. It's that important. Uh, you know, think about um, those that will say in terms of in, uh, working through text in Scripture, right? Don't stop studying and wrestling with the text until God blesses you through it, right? So you wrestle and you wrestle and you wrestle. We can say the same thing about prayer. Don't stop wrestling in prayer. It's like Jacob, right? <laughs> wrestling with God. Don't stop wrestling. I won't let go until you bless me. And sometimes that's your attitude in prayer. I, I'm going to pray and I'm going to keep praying until God, you bless me. And it's just a trust and a faith in God that will do just that. We have to wrestle with the scripture until God blesses us sometimes. We have to wrestle or strive sometimes in prayer. But we need to view it as a duty and we need to pursue it as a duty. It is uh, important. It is of paramount importance to the Christian in their Christian life. Secondly, we have to think about prayer or conceive of prayer as a dialogue. As a dialogue. Not intuitions, right? Not sitting silently in the corner of your house, in a quiet room, the lights off, everything quiet, so that you can hear the still, small voice of God in your head, right? Or the leading of your heart, or the 
You know what I'm talking about, right? We've heard people say that and think and conceive of prayer as being that. They're going to wait to listen for the audible voice of God. The dialogue comes through the word of God, right? Dialogue with God in prayer happens through the word of God. If you want to hear that dialogue audibly, then you read the word of God out loud. <laughs> I've heard that said before. But that dialogue takes place through the word of God. Dialogue, if you think about duty on one end, delight on the other in terms of our understanding and our enjoyment of prayer, dialogue is the bridge in the middle. Dialogue becomes the bridge between meditation on the Word of God and praying the Word of God, right? Dialogue happens through the Word of God. And what we mean by this, we'll look at this more specifically in a moment, but praying the Word of God, right? Considering a passage of Scripture, considering what it says, uh, consider how you're thankful for it. Consider how you can confess and repent for sin revealed in it. And then considering how you can put your supplications and petitions uh, to God because of it. It's thinking through, praying through the word of God. And then running all of your prayers, all your petitions, all of your God-glorifying worship, all of that through the dialogue of Scripture. And we are, God speaks to us through his word today. The Spirit of God, applying the word of God to the people of God, and it is through dialogue and prayer. Also, thirdly, that's all balanced now with delight, delight. If you conceive of any Christian obedience as duty only, then you've only done half your duty, right? It's only half your responsibility. Not only are you required to pray, but you are to delight yourself in prayer to God. Not only are you to obey, but you're to delight yourself in obedience, right? Not only are you to read the Word of God, but you're to delight yourself in the Word of God. Not only are you to, you know, glorify or worship God, but you are to delight yourself in God. So if you've not balanced all of this with delight, you've only done half the job. We are to, in prayer, we're to do that which stirs our heart stirs and warms our affections for God. It is true that prayer is a duty, but we have to balance that truth with delight. Yes, you should pray whether you feel like it or not, but yes, in that prayer, you should warm your affections, engage your hearts. It's sinful. It's sinful. It's shameful to be cold or joyless or indifferent in prayer. Now, that being said, we've all done it to our shame, haven't we? I know I have, to my shame, oftentimes distracted, right? Laboring, striving, working just to maintain your concentration for one minute. And often having that uh, just be a fight <laughs> to glorify God in prayer. That delight comes from adoration of God in prayer, it comes from worship of God in prayer, awe of God. Now, you think about this as we go from duty through the dialogue with God's word, dialogue with God through his word, to now delight. That dialogue with God through his word should warm our hearts, right? The word of God should raise our affections. The word of God should cause us worship and awe and reverence. The word of God informing our understanding, informing our hearts should cause us to hallow his name, to reverence him, should cause us to spill out with thanksgiving, right? Should cause the people of God to repent, to confess sin. Isn't that a delight that you can go to God in prayer and to confess your sins knowing that he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all iniquity? And that is a joy and should provoke in you delight in God. It begins with a meditation on Scripture. It begins with seeing prayer, conceiving of prayer as our duty. I was um, looking at a couple of places this week uh, with respect to how to pray. Uh, I use a specific way to pray uh, myself. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, I ran across a, a little booklet by Martin Luther called A Simple Way to Pray. And Martin Luther in the booklet... Uh, talks about prayer as being a garland, right? This garland that's made up of four strands, or a beautiful cord made up of four strands. And he divides each biblical command here into four strands. As he's reading the text, and this again is bridging the gap between dialogue and delight, or dialogue and duty, meditation and prayer. Luther's exercise here that he did twice a day, every day, twice a day, was to 
pray the word of God, bridge the gap between duty and delight, and bridge the gap between meditation on the scriptures and his prayer life. And so he divides, he takes biblical commands, or a section of text in the scripture, and he divides them into four strands. This garland divided into four strands. The first is instruction. First is instruction. The second is thanksgiving. The third is confession. And the fourth is prayer. So you have instruction, thanksgiving, confession, and prayer. In other words, what Martin Luther says there in describing this is that you turn every text, every text in the Bible that you're praying through, working through, you turn that text into a school text, a song book, a penitential book, and a prayer book. Right? A school text, a song book, a penitential book, and a prayer book. And think about the, the school text for a moment. You take a text of Scripture... And you turn it into a school text first. You're going to receive from it instruction, right? Receive from it instruction. Now, you get that instruction through your study of the Bible, your study of that text. So you observe the text. You interpret the text. You come to an understanding of its meaning, and then you apply the text to your heart and mind. Just through a study, you come to what the text means, what God intends for it to mean, um, and your application of that. So at the beginning... It's a school text. You're looking at the instruction that the text gives you. Secondly, it turns into a songbook, a songbook of thanksgiving. Consider how this text, whatever text you're studying, consider how that text leads you to praise and thank Christ. Right? So you turn that text into a songbook of thanksgiving to God. Thirdly, consider how the text leads you to confess and repent of sin. To confess and repent of sin and then fourth, consider how that text would prompt you to go to God in petition and supplication. Now think about that for a moment, okay? You come to a text of the Bible, we'll look at one as an example in a moment. And from that text, you allow the word of God to inform your prayer. So again, prayer being a duty, that being a dialogue with God through his word. And the word of God, in the hands of the spirit of God, so to speak, now teaching you to pray. And you pray back the word of God to God. When you do that, now think about it, you're praying with, in accord with his will, aren't you? You're praying in accord with his will. Uh, you're praying uh, in faith, faith in him through his word. So you're praying in accord with the mind of God when you pray through the word of God. So here, in this, Luther says, that you're building the habit of a meditative mind. You're building the habit of a meditative mind. If you have problems in your prayer life with distraction, then pray through the word of God. Hard to be distracted when you're focused on the word of God and focus in those four areas, right? Gaining instruction, uh, thanksgiving to God through it, confessing and repenting of sin, and then prayers and supplications to God. You're building the habit of a meditative mind, praying through the word of God. Luther said this, what else is it but tempting God when your mouth babbles and the mind wanders to other thoughts? Like the priest who, listen to this, like the priest who prayed, Deus in adjutorium meum intende, farmhand, did you unhitch the horses? Domine ad adjuvandum mi festina, maid, go out and milk the cow. <laughs> I guess the maid speaks King's English, but... When you pray, you pray in God hears in, in Latin. But you get the, the impression, right? You're praying, your mind distracted with thoughts of other things. Luther makes the point that to help with your distracted mind, pray the text. Pray the text. Understand the text and receive instruction. Thank God through the text. Confess sin through the text. And then raise petitions and supplications to God from the text. He calls it blasphemy. Blasphemy to approach God in any other way um, than through a focused attention on him, but to be distracted in that way. So think about the example now. We looked at Philippians chapter four, verse six, be anxious for nothing. Think about that in terms of these four steps, all right? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So think of it first, the text as a school text. So how might you in gain instruction to pray with respect to this text? God, I know that you are sovereign over all things, right? And infinitely wise. My worry, my anxiety betray a lack of trust for you in my heart. All things in my life, God, fall 
within the scope of your loving concern for me. And so I can bring everything to you in prayer and supplication, right? So in, in that way, as you think and meditate on the text, you're gaining instruction from the text. You're turning it into a school text for yourself. But then secondly, conceive of it as a songbook or a songbook of thanksgiving to God. God, Philippians 4, 6, right? What joy and comfort fills my heart to know that I can bring everything to you in prayer, that I can cast every prayer of mine upon you because you care for me. And you just praise God, thanking God for his graciousness. Thirdly, you turn it into a penitential book or a confession of sin. God, I am prone to worry. I am prone to be anxious. This particular situation, God, has got me troubled and I should trust in you, God, but I am worrying over this. Please forgive me. God, I repent of my lack of trust. I repent of my failure to acknowledge your sovereignty in this. You turn it into a penitential book. And then lastly, it's a prayer book. Cause me, God, informed by your word, empowered by your spirit, cause me to trust in you. Cause me to be anxious for nothing. I'm coming to you now, Lord, with my prayer and my supplication that you'll help me in my time of need, right? You turn it into a prayer book. So just a simple way to pray from Luther's own words, turning each text into a garland of four strands. Now, Luther would do that twice a day, every day. He'd begin with that, praying a text of scripture. But then the second thing that Martin Luther would do is that he would pray every petition in the Lord's Prayer. Turn with me to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. And these are just ideas, practical helps for you in prayer. You want to consider how to pray, a plan for prayer, what you can do for prayer. I pray these things will be helpful to you. Luther would begin by praying a text of scripture, turning each biblical command into four strands. And then he would pray every petition in the Lord's prayer. You look at Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And so he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, as, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into the temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So what Luther would do in his repetition of the Lord's Prayer twice daily would be to pray each of those petitions. And, not, and he makes a point to note, not in a ritualistic way, not using the same words, not being heartless in his prayer, but considering the nature of the petition and then praying to God in like manner. So to give you an example, now the first petition in the Lord's Prayer here is, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So listen to Luther, hallowed be thy name, and say, yes, Lord God, dear Father, hallowed be thy name, both in us and throughout the whole world. Destroy and root out the abominations, idolatry, and heresy of the Turk, the Pope, and all false teachers and fanatics who wrongly use thy name, and in scandalous ways take it in vain and horribly blaspheme it. They insistently boast that they teach thy word and the laws of the church, though they really use the devil's deceit and trickery in thy name to wretchedly seduce many poor souls throughout the world, even killing and shedding much innocent blood. And in such persecution, they believe that they render thee a divine service. That's praying, hallowed be your name, right? Luther's example of that. So your other petitions there, hallowed be your name. Lord, you would pray your kingdom come, right? Lord, I pray God that through the means of your church, your people, that the gospel would be pressed into this dark world and its sinners would turn to Christ, right? You pray that petition, that your kingdom come. Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We can plot our path, but you, Lord, direct our steps and we wholly trust in you for that, right? Your will be done. Lord, give us day by day our daily bread. Don't just take it for granted that we have that, Pray, thank the Lord for it, and pray that he would continue to give it. So forgive us our sins, and you list your sins. You see how that works? So Luther, twice daily, would pray the four-corded garland, and then he would pray each petition in the Lord's Prayer. He says at the end of all that, 
Be sure to say amen firmly. Be sure to say amen. Amen, again, not a throwaway phrase like in Jesus' name is not a throwaway phrase. Amen, at the end of your prayer, confirms your devoted trust in God for what he will do. Your trust in God that he hears you. Your refusal to doubt that God in his mercy hears you and says yes to prayers offered in his name, right? Luther says, never think that you're there standing alone, but that all Christians in their prayer are standing there with you, making their supplications known to God. Finish well. Amen. God has heard my prayer, and there is a certainty and a truth that amen communicates in that that God has heard my prayer. Now these things, these two things, he would do twice a day, every day, and then he would go into uh, prayers. Uh, he calls them prayers of the heart, things that he thought about and he needed to pray for. So as we think through that, again, a couple of different ways to think about prayer. And quickly in the time left, let me give you the content, if you will, or if you're looking for a plan for how to structure your prayer time, how to think through a way or a method of prayer, let me give you this from Matthew Henry. If you go to MatthewHenry.org, you'll see Matthew Henry's there, uh, book there called A Way to Pray, uh, sometimes called A Way to Pray. Uh, the other title is A Method of Prayer. We have Matthew Henry's book on the shelves out here. And Matthew Henry lists six different ways here or six different components to pray before God, to give you a plan, a track to run on. And he begins with adoration. Now, I've added to that, added to adoration, drawing near. Uh, drawing near to God, and then adoration. So you could add a seventh there. But adoration begins with reverence and awe of God. Now, you could say the fear of God, right? Not a, not a slavish fear, where you're in fear of punishment or in fear of condemnation. Romans chapter 8, there's no, therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Uh, 1 John chapter 4 talks about perfect love casting out fear because the fear there that should be cast out is a fear of punishment, involving punishment. So it's not a fear of condemnation, not a fear of punishment, but a fear of awe, a fear of reverence, of God's majesty. I've heard one author um, give the illustration. That it's like someone places a priceless Ming vase into your hands. When it gets to the point of being priceless, you call it a vase, right? We've got a bunch of vases around my house. But when somebody hands you this priceless Ming vase, puts it into your hands, you don't have a fear that, that thing is going to hurt you. You have a fear that it's, you're going to hurt it, right? <laughs> that you could drop it or damage it. It's priceless Ming vase. That's a product of respect, of awe, so to speak, of that vase of majesty. In this sense, it's not a fear that God is going to condemn or hurt you. It's a fear of you offending God. It's a healthy biblical fear, the fear of God. And we should draw near with that healthy biblical fear on our hearts and on our minds. Not to draw near cavalierly or presumptuously, but to draw near with reverence and awe of God. Draw near to God in the fear of God. Now that should provoke us to adoration, addressing God with reverence and awe, praying regarding God's omni, um, omnipotence, right? Praying regarding not God's omniscience, praying regarding his eternality, his sovereignty, his power, his purity, praying with an understanding of God's holiness, God's justice, God's greatness, God's truth, God's splendor, God's majesty. It's a product of awe. Aim for God's glory in your adoration. You're aiming for God's glory. As you adore God, you come to God in adoration, you're drawing near only because of Christ and his work. You realize and acknowledge that you are unworthy to draw near to God in prayer. So you confess your unworthiness. You acknowledge your great need. You profess your desire, the desire of your heart to be able to draw near to God in prayer. You profess and acknowledge your hope and your faith in him in drawing near and your confidence in his gracious condescension to hear you. In other words, you're coming to God, drawing near in humility. Drawing near to God in humility and in adoration. It begins there. 
Matthew Henry's second step is confession. Confessing your sin before God. You are unworthy to be there, but he has promised to forgive in Christ. So you confess your sins. The third step is petition. Is petition. And you can see where, like, in order to do this, right, you need time. You need time. You need a dedicated plan for praying in this way. And this is prayer. All of these things are prayer that honors God, right? Drawing near in adoration and worship, right? Confessing your sin. The, the sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite spirit. We're to go to God in confession. We're to go to God in repentance. Now petition. Asking for that what you need, asking for uh, on behalf of yourself and for others. We talked about those concentric circles, right? You begin with you, and you work out to your immediate family, and you work out to extended family, and then friends, maybe coworkers, obviously the church, brothers and sisters. So you're just praying, laying petitions before the Lord, things that others have asked you to pray for, things that you need to pray for yourself. Keep a list, keep a list. Mark down when you have answered prayer, when you see answered prayer. Sometimes the quantity of those things that you're praying for, you can't manage that in one sitting. You just don't have the time to get through it all. So separate it up by days. You know, one day, pray for the elders of the church. One day, pray for the leaders of the church. One day, pray for brothers and sisters in the church. Another day, pray for, right? Make a list and separate those out over days uh, to give you time. But you've got to have a plan to be able to do that. Next is Thanksgiving. And Matthew Henry's a way to pray or a method of prayer is thanksgiving. And again, a great way to do that is to pray through scripture, pray through the Psalms, give thanks to God. Augustine talked about, we mentioned that this morning, Augustine talked about when the psalmist prays, you pray. When the psalmist repents, you repent. When the psalmist fights, you fight. When the psalmist thanks God, you thank God. When the, the psalmist worships, you worship. Just pray through the text of scripture that way. Next is intercession, intercession, interceding on behalf of others in prayer. And then lastly is a conclusion where you commend your prayers to God in his name and you say amen, right? Agreeing with scripture, agreeing with the word of God, acknowledging God's promises in the word of God to hear your prayer. And that prayers in his name in accordance with his will in faith, without doubting, are prayers that he answers. And it's just resting and trusting in him to hear you and answer your prayer, right? So let me just, I, I want to conclude by pressing on you the importance, as we've talked about in the last three weeks, of committing yourself to prayer, committing yourself, devoting yourself to this critically important part of the Christian life. Um, there are theologians throughout the, the centuries that have called it the highest of Christian graces, right? The blessing of prayer. So commit yourself to prayer. The way to do that is to conceive of it first as a duty. I must do this. I must prioritize it. I must devote time to it. Uh, I need a plan. I need to be, I need to walk circumspectly with respect to this. I need to think through it. I need to have a, a determined plan in place to honor the Lord in my prayer life. Then pray through the scripture. Maybe use the same method that a Martin Luther or a Matthew Henry or John Calvin used, and then delight in it. And you'll see God's blessing through it. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, again, we confess our need to you. Uh, confess our unworthiness to come before you in prayer. Uh, confess our great need, our great dependence upon you in prayer, and rejoice that we can come in Christ and in his name to pray to you, our heavenly father, and know because of all that he's done for us, that which he has secured for us at the cross, we know that you hear us and God, you've promised that when we pray in his name, according to your will, that we have those things that we've prayed for. And we thank you, Lord, for that blessed promise. And we trust you and depend upon you, Lord, and seek your, your face in prayer, uh, knowing that you are good and kind and gracious, Lord, and you are there, Lord, to help us in our time of need. You hear us. We thank you for that. What a tremendous blessing, Lord. May you be praised in Jesus' name. Amen.